people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Big success does not come without big challenges. This popular saying is applicable to India now more than ever. As Brad India thrives economically and socially, both domestically and globally, detractors continue to rear their heads. While many are calling this India's decade, Hungarian-American billionaire investor George Soros and his entire network have begun an attack on Brand India and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. In this era of 5G warfare, when wars are fought over keyboards more than on battlefields and when it is increasingly difficult to distinguish between allies and adversaries, India, the world's fifth largest economy, cannot afford to be complacent. Join us as we take a deeper look at who is responsible for these anti-Indian agendas and attacks and see how and why they are bound to fail. Ninety-two-year-old George Soros is not simply an old, opinionated billionaire. For decades, he has spent billions attempting to control the global political landscape. He has been previously accused of conspiring to undermine and topple regimes world over, while at the same time making his billions betting on countries to fail. In his recent comments at the Munich Security Conference, Soros said that India is a democracy, but its leader, Narendra Modi, is no democrat. The contradiction and hypocrisy wasn't lost on anyone. Alert open source intelligence gathering organization, this info lab, recently presented a graphic showing Soros' alleged links to organizations and nation-states that have been working against Brand India's rise. In this thread, we see links between Pakistan and disgraced ISI operative Gulam Nabi Fai, who has been charged in the United States in the past with conspiracy and tax evasion. This isn't the first time George Soros and his Open Society platform are in the news. Recently, a United States-based group named MRC Business, short for Media Research Center, released a shocking study that alleged links between George Soros and his affiliate organizations with 253 media organizations. A report in Fox News quoted MRC business analysts Joseph Vasquez and Daniel Schneider. The journalism group Soros supports have the ability to mold public opinion on practically every continent and in many languages. And now, Soros and his cabal have trained their guns on India. I could take a view that the individual in question, Mr. Soros, is a uh, old, rich, opinionated person sitting in New York who still thinks that his views should determine how the entire world works. Now, if I could only stop at old, rich, and opinionated, I would put it away. But he is old, rich, opinionated, and dangerous. The billionaire investor had pledged 1 billion USD to fund a new international university network to counter nationalist leaders in 2020. Through his extremely vast network, Soros is trying to ensure that his views dictate how the world should function. With his latest anti-India statement, Soros appeared to be pandering to talking points parroted by Pakistan's military and civilian leadership. The Indian Prime Minister has topped approval ratings year on year and has followed an independent foreign policy divorced from any external pressures. This has rattled the old guard globalists that previously influenced Indian foreign policy. In an effort to advance the anti-Modi narrative, the BBC, or British Broadcasting Corporation, recently aired an anti-Modi documentary. Both the timing and the content of the documentary were questioned. The BBC, however, suffered a blow in its own backyard when Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, flatly rejected the documentary's contention. 
Mr Speaker, the UK Government's position on this has been clear and long-standing and, and hasn't changed. Of course, we don't tolerate persecution where it appears anywhere, but I'm not sure I agree at all with the characterisation that the Honourable Gentleman has put forth. Repeated questions in the U.S. State Department and White House briefings by so-called reporters to corner India's foreign policy were met with swift deflections, a nod to the West's acceptance of India's stance on its strategic decisions. An example was seen recently when a Pakistani reporter who tried to corner India's decision to survey the BBC for its alleged tax issues was shut down by the U.S. State Department. The Indian government is now raiding the offices of uh, BBC in New Delhi and Mumbai. Uh, your thoughts, any concern? We're aware of the search of the BBC offices in Delhi by Indian tax authorities. I'm going to have to refer you to um, uh, to the government of India for any further information about this. India's successful economic handling of post-COVID headwinds has placed her in a much more secure position than many neighbors and countries throughout the world. As India continues to garner praise for her recent achievements, critics will continue to discount them by any means necessary. Misinformation and other 5G warfare techniques will become even more prominent in years ahead. While India has been giving a befitting reply to enemies along the border, there are many who have betrayed her idea of Asudeva Kutumbakam and have tried to damage the ideas of peace it propagates. A booming brand India can never be completely immune to attacks and threats coming from inside and outside her borders. Brand India can, however, continue to best arm herself against these attacks. With economic and tech successes coupled with India's global outreach and diplomacy, the Indian model continues to be emulated world over. Moving on. People in Sri Lanka are left high and dry as massive electricity tariffs have crippled businesses and other everyday activities. While many of them have been forced to shut their shops, others are keeping their businesses afloat without any margins. Several groups have also taken to the streets, demanding the rollback. The government had earlier said that it was forced to take tough measures in the larger interest of the common people and was empathetic towards its citizens who were bearing the brunt of the price rise. Fish Bakers has been providing Colombo residents with bread, buns and other baked delicacies for the past 25 years. The greatest economic crisis the nation has seen in decades has caused customers to tighten their purse strings. The new electricity rate increase that was announced last week has made business even more challenging. Sanjula Perez, the 23-year-old proprietor, claims that legacy and history rather than current profits are what keep the company afloat. අවුරුදු 5කට පස්සේ ගිහිල්ලා බැලුවොත් එහෙම දැන්ට අපේ සේල් එක සාමාන්‍යයෙන් 100කට 50කින් විතර අඩු වෙලා තියෙනවා. සේවක ප්‍රමාණෙත් වැඩ ගන්න ප්‍රමාණය 100කට 50කින් විතර අඩු වෙලා තියෙනවා. ඒකට හෙක හේතුවක් තමයි දැන් තියෙන බඩු මිලත් එක්ක කරන්ට් බිලත් එක්ක වියදම් ඔක්කොම වැඩි වෙලා තියෙනවා. අපිට නිෂ්පාදනය අපිට කරන්න පුළුවන් වුණත් ගන්න අපිට පාරිභෝගිකව අඩු වෙලා තියෙනවා. එකක් ඒ මිනිසුන් අතේ සල්ලි නැහැ අපිට බලෙන් විකුණන්නත් බෑ. Perry's father founded the modest family-owned bakery firm nearly three decades ago. It now makes 300 loaves daily. It has 60 staff, 15 locations and has already increased the cost of its goods by a factor of two since the middle of last year when the country's economic crisis was at its worst. Perry's claimed that because they could not afford to hike prices more out of concern for losing more clients, the bakery was forced to bear the pain by firing employees and cutting expenses everywhere they could. The government increased electricity costs by 75% last year before announcing the 66% rise last Thursday. The government is hoping that this action will convince the IMF to offer a bailout. When a dang sapexa belotem, a dang labena, ada men, padina digivagin, eighteen a loan, 
लीसी एवं गिवागे ने गिया ट पास से तीन ने सुलु प्रमाण के लाभ हैं मैं के आउट दो विशिष्ट भागट वैरी प्रमाण या करेगे ना निशा पावत्व के ने आना मिस अतिलाभ अडू विदुल भी लगे ना कतार होते हैं मैं सरिन सरे विदुल का पादु निशा आपे बैडो ओको में ने हिट लाती है ना आपे टे जेनी दान आपे टे डीसल आवास चलाती है ना ये विदिर डीसी विदिर डीसल गान आपे टे क्यूआर क्रमयक का शेड्यूलिंग ये आवास आपे टे विदिर गान क्रमयक नया आपे टे ताम पेरीज इज़ नॉट अलोन श्रीलंका's 5,000 odd bakeries, which employ about 2 lakh people, have been badly hit with many finding it difficult to repay loans after the central bank was forced to increase interest rates to record highs last year. Meanwhile, thousands of demonstrators gathered in Sri Lanka to call on the government to refrain from enacting significant tax and electricity bill increases. The protesters, who represented a variety of professions, blocked a busy street close to a railway station and shouted many slogans. Chandatha Ilang Singha, a spokesman for the University Teachers Association, issued a strike warning for March if their concerns were not resolved. South Asia, which is experiencing a crisis, will need to raise taxes in order to boost government revenue from 8.3% of GDP in 2022 to 11.3% of GDP this year. Moving on. Afghanistan continues to remain in a state of general lawlessness, instability and remains rampant with human rights abuses as a result of the Taliban's brutal rule. Afghans have been forced to flee the country. However, for many lucky to have escaped and received asylum on foreign soil, challenges persist. From mistreatment to forceful deportation, Afghan migrants continue to face many obstacles and limitations. Afghanistan continues to remain in a state of general lawlessness, instability, and remains rampant with human rights abuses as a result of the Taliban's brutal rule. Afghans have been forced to flee the country. However, for many lucky to have escaped and received asylum on foreign soil, challenges persist. From mistreatment to forceful deportation, Afghan migrants continue to face many obstacles and limitations. This is Obaida Sharar, a former Afghan prosecutor. She obtained asylum in Spain after leaving her homeland when the Taliban took control of Kabul. Prior to being granted asylum, Obaida spent a year in Pakistan without any official refugee status. Former Afghan prosecutors like Obaida are attempting to evade the men they had been prosecuting in the war-torn country. Living in Madrid, Obaida feels much safer in her new life but is still troubled by the struggles the women of her country continue to face on a daily basis. I can do anything that I want, but there are lots of women remaining in Afghanistan and they, they are sentenced to be inside their houses, inside the walls. And this is not still, I cannot enjoy from my life. Because, because the women in my country, they are not free. They cannot do anything. Female lawyers are no longer permitted inside the Ministry of Justice since the Taliban took control of the Independent Bar Association. The association remains only open to men. While Obaida is a very lucky example, many others who have escaped Afghanistan to other underdeveloped nations face mounting struggles. According to Human Rights Watch, many refugees from Afghanistan are being forcibly pushed back from some of the countries they initially had escaped to. Pakistan and Turkey, for example, have forcibly deported a large number of Afghan migrants back to Afghanistan. Thousands of Afghan asylum seekers lack the necessary travel permits and documents that are typically required. Despite lacking requisite documentation, many have still fled 
endangering their lives in the process, all in hope of a better future. According to U.S. government data, the number of Afghans seeking asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border has increased manifold. The data shows that U.S. border agents apprehended 2,132 Afghans last year, a nearly 30-fold increase from the previous year. Every month, hundreds of people risk traveling a human smuggling route known for kidnapping and robbery. If that part of the journey is successful, it is still uncertain whether Afghans will be able to find long-term asylum in the United States. There was fence, and there were the people and put the ladder in the fence. So we climbed on the ladder and uh, came to the land of the U.S. and uh, between the two walls, you know, between the two faces. Afghans face a terrible choice. Risk their lives fleeing their homes or stay behind and continue to face persecution and human rights violations at the hands of the Taliban. Afghanistan has also been struggling with food insecurity and natural disasters. The Taliban's ban on woman aid workers further intensified this crisis. Programs cannot reach women and cannot um, understand the situation of women and girls without employing women. So uh, men-only programming uh, is, is not merely um, uh, a, a subjugation of women, but it's also uh, inadequate programming. It doesn't work. It's simple as that. Under the Taliban, Afghanistan is experiencing one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world, and humanitarian assistance is urgently needed. India is one country who pledged to provide assistance of approximately 24 million USD for Afghanistan. However, significantly more is needed to help those Afghans struggling in their homeland, and for those Afghans who have fled their homeland for the chance at a better life. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Negotiations on a code of conduct for South China Sea will be intensified this year. Indonesian and Chinese officials said this week as the region frets over China's assertiveness in the strategic waterway. Indonesia's Foreign Minister Ratno Marsudi met with Chinese counterpart King Yang in Jakarta ahead of a round of negotiations on the code starting in March. Kin told reporters in a news conference that China and ASEAN will jointly safeguard peace and stability in the strategic trade corridor through which about $3.4 trillion of goods pass each year. Beijing claims much of the South China Sea and has built islands from which it is capable of deploying advanced weaponry. The Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan and Brunei also have some overlapping claims. Washoku, a traditional dietary culture in Japanese, is also registered as a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage. A number of seasonal dishes are prepared using Japanese ingredients, which is a tradition among the artisan chefs. A training program was conducted at a Washoku restaurant in Kyoto recently with the support of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries of Japan to develop foreign human resources. As many as 12 chefs were trained for 10 days. At the training report presentation, each chef announced what they have experienced during the training. The local products are very important in Japanese cuisine, um, but I didn't uh, know that so much. And the uh, uh, highest quality of these products uh, are so uh, on uh, very high quality. 
these young chefs know the complexity and flavors of Japanese ingredients and these training programs will help promote washoku all over the world. A furniture exhibition was recently held in Tokyo, Japan. A variety of inbound conscious products are introduced at the exhibition. Fukui Prefecture in Japan is famous for its wood and timber. Inside this trailer, a special theater room made of wood. As this space is well designed and made of wood, it gives a sense of warmth to the visitors along with high quality sound. ま、広い、例えば芝生の大きい広場とかで、あの、シアタールーム的な感じで使うこともできますし、日本の杉の良さっていうのを一つ感じてほしいなとは思うんですけども、福井県の杉を使ったいろんな技術がありますので、そういう
Losar has been celebrated in Tibet for over 1,000 years. Tibetans brought this culture to India and today it is seen as a landmark for spiritual growth. Tibetan tradition festival Losar is a celebration of harvesting crops. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.